The Pantheon Rise of the Fallen developers recently revealed a new tool in their toolbox that will make building the world of Terminus much faster. I've been talking a lot lately about how Pantheon's development has undergone some crucial changes in the past year or so. In my last video, we learned about lead programmer Kyle Olson, who has been doing a ton of work to streamline the code of the game, to make it run smoother, and make it much easier to add new systems. Now that's the under the hood stuff, which is no doubt very important, but it's not necessarily as easy for us as viewers on the outside to really track the progress of that. So today we're gonna talk about the other side of things, which is world building and the art pipeline that is of course much more visible to us who are watching. And remember, as Pantheon's development process picks up pace now, if you don't wanna miss out on any of the news, hit the subscribe button now because that's what this channel is completely dedicated to. Before I get into the details of that new world building tool I mentioned in the intro, I want to back up a bit and review why this is such an important shift. As far back as the making of a city stream with Co Carnage in November 2017, we have seen some grey boxing in game. It was explained that grey boxing is basically a quick way to use solid, textureless shapes to plot out zones. We saw the outlines of buildings, walls, objects, etc. that could be easily adjusted to establish this sense of scale and spatial relationships for that area. And then once the developers are satisfied with the layout for the sake of gameplay, the artists then come back later and simply apply the detailed textures to the appropriate gray box objects. Makes sense, right? And in all of the streams that we had seen after that, the gray box objects seemed to be the exception rather than the norm. Until more recent streams where we've seen a lot more gray boxing, even in zones that previously appeared to be much more fleshed out. When thinking about traditional game development, this makes less sense and led some people to believe that development was moving backward. But upon closer inspection, this seems to be more of a case of taking one step back in order to take two steps forward. You see, almost all of the art assets in the zone we had seen in streams before Fairthail was revealed were not handmade by Visionary Realms, but were instead purchased from the Unity Asset Store and then simply placed in the world. When asked why it was done this way, creative director Chris Joppa Perkins said, quote, We believed that was the best way to depict what Pantheon would look like while giving us the ability to prototype gameplay. And it's not totally uncommon, though gray boxing is the true industry standard when you have a typically closed development process, end quote. So because Pantheon is a crowdfunded game, where Visionary Realms started with very little money, they felt the need to quickly present something that resembled the finished product they were shooting for in order to raise awareness for the game. Whereas in an ideal world, if they were a larger company with financial backing on day one, they could have afforded to take the more efficient approach of keeping it all a secret and just jumping straight into gray boxing because there'd be no one on the outside judging what it looks like. Crowdfunding a game like this is tricky because you need to keep making forward progress without abiding by all the traditional methods of game development. For example, gray boxing everything might not generate the excitement needed to secure funding early on and get the ball rolling because, as senior concept artist Jared Pullen explains, it's naturally more difficult for people to imagine what a game will eventually look like when all you see is gray boxing. The temptation with gray boxing, it is, it is a bit of a trap is to see what's there and feel that you have nothing, to feel that you're lacking something. It's less about what you don't see and more about the promise of what you will, what you will get. So these, oh, I, you know, I want the audience to go, man, there's a gray box. Okay, there's promise here. What will the team bring? And, and we will bring it. We will definitely bring it. There's so much planned in here. This is a tool. You guys are getting a, uh, you know, a window in, a backstage pass into how we go about this process. But it's more about the promise of what will be. So that's basically why Unity Store assets were used and why the world appeared to be fairly polished at first glance. 
Now again, it's worth noting that not everything was Unity assets. Some art, like what we saw in Fairthale and in that Making of a City stream, was made in-house and is still used today. But most everything else was Unity assets. And going back to that quote from Joppa, he explains why that just wasn't going to be a permanent solution. Quote, when the majority of your game world is built using a smattering of different art assets, from different authors with different rendering pipelines, poly budgets, art styles, etc., you end up with a world that cannot be woven together system-wise to be a performant game. You also severely limit your ability to design zones freely because you are working with a rigid terrain versus building what you actually want and need." End quote. So they had to change gears. And in the October 2020 Pantheon producers letter, we learned that quote, all zones outside of big sections of Fairthale are in a gray box state. Previously seen zones like Thronefast and Avendir's Pass have been redone to gray box spec to allow for the proper pipeline and optimization, end quote. And that's a lot of what they've been up to over the past year or so. Now, in regards to why this was done during pre-alpha, Joppa also said, quote, it was a hard call, but ultimately better to do it sooner with fewer zones than wait to do it later. Doing it with Throne Fast, Avendir's Pass, etc. also allowed us to solidify that process slash pipeline so we can develop all zones from here on out with that same proven process. So yeah, it's always hard to look at something and say, this simply isn't watertight and won't hold up the way we need it too long term. We need to truly fix it, but it was the right decision for the long-term health of Pantheon." End quote. So that brings us to the current state of the game, where they're taking what they learned about how they want those zones to be laid out, and applying that with much more powerful tools that allow them to build the zones from the ground up. Not just better, but actually faster. One such tool is Houdini, which those of you in game development have probably heard of before. It's not entirely new, but it wasn't until more recently that it became compatible with Unity, which is the engine that Pantheon runs on. And it's also usually something that only the larger AAA studios have access to. So the fact that a small independent studio like Visionary Realms was able to get their hands on it is pretty significant. One of the biggest ways that Houdini will make building the world of Pantheon a lot easier is that right out of the box, it can procedurally generate all the plants, trees, rock formations, rivers, etc. in a zone basically with the click of a button. And with a little more customization, it could also procedurally generate things like caves, bridges, roads, and even some buildings. Procedural generation means that while it does this automatically, it's doing so intelligently. In this case, based on the topography that senior environment artist Jimmy Lane sketches out with basic gray box objects. This is a portion of the uh, terrain of Fairthale, that specifically it's ma mainly old wood, with some ghetto mountains that I threw in using the Pro Builder uh, tool, plugin, and, and I guess it's a package in Unity. And then I, I exported that stuff, both the terrain as well as the Pro Builder mesh, and eroded them together. And it, it's just amazing. This is, this is so exciting that this happened, like this right here happened from, from that. You know? Like, when, when, you, when you have to build a world that's this big um and you've got a really small team for us to get from this this and it can place trees and rocks on it that's amazing that's straight up amazing and so that's what we did that's we we committed to this concept uh and we started moving forward <laughs> we started moving forward to the rest of the world uh with the knowledge that we then had from PA4 to apply to it. This is something that's simply not possible with Unity Store assets, because with those, what you get is what you get. There's no flexibility or automation. Being able to procedurally generate things is obviously a huge time saver, but remember, not all of the content in Pantheon is procedurally generated, like in some games where we hear that term used, like Minecraft or No Man's Sky. 
Houdini just takes care of the geographical features that are needed to make the world feel believable, but are also very monotonous and time consuming to do by hand. That takes out a lot of the brunt work so that the designers can then come in and focus on hand placing the rest of the content to finish bringing the area to life exactly how they want it. This is things like NPCs, climates, perception, etc. As you can imagine, this is a much better position to be in than before when every single detail had to be manually placed. In fact, we can see it happen right before our eyes. But like this is this is that location and it's that geo that's being represented right here um, in a low res form, but you know, still. So what we do with it is we erode it. You know, same thing, it's right there, but now it's got an erosion uh, I'm able to then break it into, like, you know, deal with the water, deal with the road that's right there. You can't really tell, but it's it's been smoothed out a bit, um, which is super cool. And then we start to deal with hole cutting. There's no hole cutting in this demo, but that's what happens. And uh, I'm going to push up the, the rock layer a little bit, and now we're going to start laying in assets. So this old these old wood trees have been placed based on geo within... Um, it, it's like a, a biome mask. And that allows us to, you know... I don't have to hand place these, they just they go wherever that mask is. So that's kind of a cool little side note. Uh, place some roots on it add in some rocks where the the cliffs are too sheer maybe add in some more rocks maybe add in some more rocks add in some vines wherever there are uh, surfaces that have the sheer enough angle for a vine um, add in some trees and then paint it why not <laughs> So this is an example of where the grass would be painted and like where dirt would be painted and where water would go. It's it's not a full compa complete like painted map that I'm outputting right this second, but it's just to show y'all that you know this that was all generated just from this content right here. Like just this mesh right here is what made this. And it's just really I think it's a bright future. It does seem like a bright future, certainly better than before. Now, I still don't necessarily expect world building to be blazingly fast because, mind you, as of the recording of this video, Jared Pullen is the only concept artist and Jimmy Lane is the only world builder on the team. But they recently announced that they are hiring for a technical artist, which will definitely help as well. And I expect the team, of course, to expand more in the future as additional funding comes in. So. Things do at least seem to be trending in the right direction. Houdini should really help them to finish building the continent of King's Reach, at which point there should be enough content to allow alpha testers to come in, and that will be a very pivotal moment. So there is a path here, and I'll discuss the other steps that they'll need to take to get to alpha in my next video. But until then, everybody, stay curious and adventure on. Yeah.